Hello, and today we're talking all about ovulation. I'm answering your questions. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and welcome to the YouTube channel. I love answering your questions and we are going to dive into them. So these are questions that you've asked on other videos in the comments that we thought other people might wonder the same thing. So we're going to dive into them. This is why answering your questions, even if we can't get to it in that moment, we might get to it sometime. Today we're talking all about ovulation. So these are going to be questions about the ovulation process, tracking your ovulation, and trying to understand it better. Before we dive into that, I just want to say a huge thanks for being here. I love seeing all your new faces. If you found me over here because of the Huberman podcast, that was such a fun and crazy experience. I was in LA for less than 24 hours, such a whirlwind, but I'm happy to be here seeing so many new faces and educating you about reproductive health, your body, and fertility. If we're going to talk about ovulation and answer these questions, we've got to talk about the ovulatory process real fast to lay the groundwork. So let's just remember, if we imagine inside our ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept, at the beginning of a month or at the beginning of your life, you have all your eggs, and at the beginning of every single month, you're going to have an entire group of eggs that is sent out of the vault. Each egg is inside a follicle. What happens is from your life, from the beginning until you start puberty, you don't have any eggs ovulate. Eggs are released and they die, and the next month another group of eggs comes out of the vault. Once you get to the place where you're going to start ovulating, this is the transition through puberty and when you have your menstrual cycle. What then happens is now the brain is sending out FSH in strong enough amounts for the ovary to respond and start growing one of those follicles. As that follicle grows, the egg inside is going to start maturing, and that mature egg is making estrogen. That estrogen is growing the lining of the uterus and preparing it for a possible implantation, but it's also making you feel great, making you have energy, making your libido a little bit better. It is preparing the body, and this is the follicular phase. So from the time you have your period or your bleeding, until the time where you ovulate, when you grow a follicle, when the brain sends out FSH, this is the follicular phase. Estrogen is high. It's estrogen dominant. Progesterone is low. It's super normal. Then when that mature follicle has been at the mature level, which is typically about 200 picograms per milliliter of estrogen for 50 hours or more, the brain is going to sense that. I always say the brain and the ovary are best friends who live in different states, before FaceTime. So they just talk on the phone. They don't really know what the other person's doing or they can't see them. So what happens is once that estrogen is high enough, the brain is then going to send out a surge of LH. And LH is luteinizing hormone. It hasn't been playing a role in the follicular phase. FSH was the dominant hormone from the brain. Now suddenly you get a big surge of LH and that surge of LH is going to trigger this follicle where the egg is to ovulate. It ruptures, the cyst ruptures, the fluid comes out, including the egg. And that egg hopefully gets captured and sucked up by the fallopian tube. And then what happens is that cyst that grew the follicle now is going to reform and become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is an essential part of getting pregnant or the cycle in general. It is going to respond to pulsatile LH or luteinizing hormone. And that pulsatile LH is going to stimulate the corpus luteum to make progesterone. And because it's being simulated in pulsatile fashion, progesterone will also be made in pulses. The corpus luteum this time period is the luteal phase. So now we have progesterone and estrogen. We have both hormones. The corpus luteum can only live about 12 to 14 days, and then it's going to die. Progesterone will drop, the body senses you aren't pregnant, and you're going to get shedding of that endometrial lining, and the ovaries are going to have a new group of follicles ready to respond to that new FSH coming from the brain. What is going to happen if you get pregnant is that pregnancy is going to come in, and it will have HCG made, and that HCG from the pregnancy will now stimulate constant and exponentially higher levels of progesterone production from that corpus luteum. And I do have videos on implantation and progesterone if you want to learn more about that phase in general. But I'm going to get to a few of your ovulation questions because this process can be so confusing. One important thing to realize when you're tracking your ovulation is that in general, your cycle should be about the same days every month. 
It's not going to be the exact same, but it really shouldn't vary by more than a couple. So if your cycles are every 26, 28 days, fine. Every 32 to 34, fine. But if it's 24 one month, then 36, then 21, then 32, not fine, not fine. That's what I call irregularly regular, not full on skipping a cycle, but your ovulatory pattern is definitely showing us some dysfunction and should be paid attention to. When we think about the cycle, the luteal phase is set. Usually we think about it as 14 days. The luteal phase is set. The follicular phase is what varies. So in a person who has 25 day cycles, you would anticipate she ovulates at 25 minus 14 cycle day 11. And if you have somebody who has 35 day cycles, you would anticipate she would ovulate at 35 minus 14 or cycle day 21. So this day of ovulation that some people hear, oh, people ovulate day 14, that is all presuming a 28 day period. So the luteal phase is what's set. Follicular phase varies based on cycle length. And if you're using an app, it's taken that formula and applying it to you. Now the formula will or should change based on what your cycle is actually giving it. But that's why studies have shown that apps are not great at predicting when you're actually ovulating. Okay, let's get to your questions. I have been using ovulation strips for six months trying to get pregnant. One month I get a high like 0.9 and others don't go above 0.2. Is there something wrong or should I see my doctor? So importantly, remember that ovulation strips are checking the hormone LH. Now the numbers you give are going to be different based on what tests that you're doing, but the reality is LH is going to rise one time and then is going to rise and fall and rise and fall. Capturing the peak can be hard because it's usually starting in the early morning hours. So once you get a positive, if it's as dark as the control or darker, believe it. But you have to be testing ahead of time to have negatives to know when that first positive happens. And then when that first positive happens, you're going to ovulate, we generally say the next day, because that's the surge to tell your body to ovulate. You don't ovulate till the next day. Now, if these strips make sense, you get your period about two weeks after when you get what you think is your positive, then I'm not worried about it because ovulation tests and numbers matter on how dilute your urine is and the time of day that you're checking it at and a lot of other factors. But if you're getting a positive and then your period's coming seven days afterward or 20 days afterward, those numbers don't make sense to me. And then I would recommend that you go get an evaluation. Also remember your age. If you've been trying to get pregnant for six months and you're 35 or older, you meet the definition for infertility and you should go in now. If you're younger and you're having regular periods, even if you're not detecting ovulation, you can go up to 12 months if you're having regular cycles. If you're having trouble knowing when you're ovulating, you can always just have intercourse every other day from days 10 to 18. And in most people, in most cycle cases, that's gonna cover your basis. Question about ovulation. Sometimes my BBT will rise, but I have egg white cervical mucus, and then two to three days later, the temp drops. It tries again a week later, sometimes the week after two, which is when I'll actually ovulate. I'll have sustained temps for 12 days. Why is this? BBT is the absolute hardest thing to measure and my least favorite method of fertility tracking. BBT is basal body temperature and it is the idea that your body temperature will rise one half to one full degree once your body is making progesterone. You should not have egg white cervical mucus and a high BBT on the same day. If you do, it's not a real basal body temp increase. So either your detection mechanism is faulty. Remember you have to detect it before you get out of bed. The first first thing in the morning, before you drink any water, while you're still laying down. You can't be taking any like decongestants, you can't be drinking alcohol, you can't be sick. So there's all these different things that can impact your body temperature. And then things like thyroid disease and other things, having low ovarian reserve, they can change it. So egg white cervical mucus, that's type four cervical mucus caused by high estrogen levels, very specific for the day of ovulation. Your BBT shouldn't rise until two to three days afterward because you're waiting until that progesterone is rising. So it sounds like when you're getting to the sustained temperature for 12 days, that's your true BBT rise. That is the one I would count on ovulation. Either you're just sensitive, it's something in the detection mechanism, if you're drinking alcohol or there's something else that's throwing it off on the other days, but I wouldn't be relying on them. Remember, once your BBT has risen, you're past the point. The egg only lives for 24 hours. So it's just telling you when you did ovulate, 
retrospectively so you can try to apply it to other cycles. If you're having trouble, maybe try OPKs. I do have a video on those like we just talked about before that might help solidify when you're actually ovulating. All right. Hello, I get very thick cervical mucus and does that mean I am about to ovulate or in the coming days I'm currently ovulating? What triggers it? Here we go. All right, egg white cervical mucus is type four cervical mucus. Your cervical mucus changes with estrogen. So the higher your estrogen is getting from that mature egg, it's actually going to change and thin out the cervical mucus and make it stickier, but make it so it's easier for the sperm to swim through. So you have that egg white, you pull it apart, it kind of sticks between your fingers, cervical mucus on the day you're ovulating. So if you're gonna have sex one day and you have a lot of cervical mucus, that's the day. If you're going to have sex two days, it'd be the day of the mucus and the next day because the egg can live for 24 hours. These are different methods of fertility awareness. So you have cervical mucus, BBT, and ovulation predictor kits. These can all be helpful to help you understand when you're ovulating so that either one, you can go get care faster if you aren't detecting a regular ovulation, or two, you can get pregnant faster and studies have shown that they're all equal but that using some method of a fertility awareness to track your ovulation helps you get pregnant faster. Hope this helped you. As always, you can get more information on the As Woman podcast. You can also ask your questions down below. Follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, but hopefully we'll answer some of your questions. Thanks friends.